we're going to just ask some questions this week. We're going to be in John chapter 8, and by asking uh, hopefully some good questions of this text, I think we'll actually learn a lot. But not just learn a lot, I think it'll change the way we approach um, our words and how we use them. If you're paying attention, everything we're talking about for the next few weeks here is about our mouth and how we tend to misuse our mouth and how that will not only rob us of the life that God has for us, but also uh, interrupt our relationship with God and, and cause a, a barrier between us and our God. Uh, the things that we talk about today, we're, we're like today we're in John, uh, as much as this is a New Testament theme and a Jesus theme, it's also an Old Testament theme and it runs throughout the Old Testament. And God has very strong words to say for those uh, who uh, use their mouth to not honor him. So let's pray and we'll jump in. Lord God, uh, we thank you that you gave us the gift of speech. You gave us the ability to communicate and to talk with those that we love and to express our hearts to them. And there's so much that's amazing and wonderful. And yet we take that wonderful gift and we use it uh, with an evil inclination. So Lord, help us uh, this week as we shift from complaining to criticism and help us to see what we're doing and help us to not be that person. Help us to be the person you've called us to be. Help us to be more like Jesus. May you be our Heavenly Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, first question, pretty simple. Why do we speak? You'll notice there's no blanks. There's still some room to take some notes, but no blanks because I just don't want you to miss the words. Why do we speak? Well, we speak for a lot of reasons. We speak when we're hungry. We speak when, uh, you know, we, we want something from people. Most people would think, well, I speak to give information because I'm just full of it, right? <laughs> Which is true. But in the end, one of the things we need to realize, every time we speak, there's a reason we're speaking. And only you can answer it in any given moment. Why? And matter of fact, I think the best question to ask is why am I saying what I'm saying? What are behind my words? What is it that I really want from a person? You may be giving them information, but why are you giving them information? So they'll think you're smart? So they'll think you're, you know, good, whatever. I mean, what is it that's behind what motivates you to speak? As we jump into John chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 31. Jesus is having a conversation with the people in the courtyard, as you saw, but there's some Pharisees there as well. Uh, and this is what Jesus said. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So that's his statement. And that statement is just going to trigger a firestorm of conversation that eventually is going to end in them wanting to stone him. Okay, so this is going to go bad quickly. But in that statement, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is loving and launching a group of 12 men to be his disciples. He is loving them well. He has been with them for three years. He's you know, getting to the home stretch of that time where it's going to come time to launch them out to make a difference in the world. And he's talking to them with everybody else listening, everybody else that's there in the courtyard. And he's talking to them saying, if you're really my disciple, you're going to abide in my word. Now, what does it mean to abide in his word? What does that mean? This shapes our, our values here. This shapes how we communicate our values, and it, and it shapes how we do sermons. We don't do sermons just to give you more information. We don't give you sermons just so you'll know the truth. Knowing the truth doesn't get the job done. What gets the job done? Abiding in the truth living the truth. We, we state it in our value statement as relentlessly living the word of God. We don't learn it just to learn it. Oh, that was nice. That was, I never knew that before. That's a new thought. I've never had that thought before. Wasn't that a good Sunday morning? That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to put this out and we structure our messages here so that there's application to actually live out. What does it mean to actually live out this truth that in this case, Jesus is, is talking about? So he says, Abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So knowing the truth is a part of it, but knowing the truth is not the end game. The end game is abiding. You have to know it to abide in it, right? I mean, that just makes sense. And if you do, if you abide in it, it will set you free. Now, what does that mean? We all have things in our life that want to control us. We all have things in our life. And he's going to talk about sin, which is that, that brokenness that is in each and every one of us that causes us to do things that would alienate us from God. Jesus said, if you live in my truth, if you abide in my truth, you're going to be free from that. 
How many think that's a really good idea? How many have given up on it, though? He said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple, and the truth will set you free. So this is their response, verse 33. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone, which I think is really interesting because are they just talking about themselves personally or the people of God, right? The people of God have been enslaved in Egypt, and right now they're under Roman tyranny. Call me crazy, but the Romans are telling them what to do, right? But they're talking about, and again, it's probably more of a Pharisee, somebody who's higher level of society, who's kind of insulated themselves from all the stuff that's going on, and it's like, we don't need to be freed. You would think that that, oh, okay, that's something that some old guy said a long time ago. How many people say that in our culture today? How many times has a Christian person said, you know, if you follow Jesus, it'll set you free? And they'll go, well, I don't need to be set free from anything. I'm really quite final. I'm okay. But Jesus is talking about something specific that we're set free from. And it is our brokenness of who we are on the inside. It is the sin that lives within us that we can be set free from. So we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. So they thought God thought they were special because they were descendants of Abraham. That's kind of the, the thought there. And how is it that you say you will become free? So why are the Pharisees speaking and why is Jesus speaking? The Pharisees are speaking because they want to build themselves up. They want to tear Jesus down. And they want to prove to everybody that they're superior. So why is Jesus speaking? Jesus is speaking because he wants to make disciples. Jesus is speaking is because he wants to give people the truth. He wants them to follow him, abide in his words, and they will be set free. So Jesus has an agenda. The, 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 the crowds kind of fueled by the Pharisees have an agenda. We all have an agenda when we speak. The question is, what's yours? It's like, well, it depends what conversation I'm in. Exactly. So part of this wonderful little tool that you have on your wrist will help you when, when you start to speak with somebody this week. It's like, okay, why am I saying what I'm saying? So first, why do people speak? Second, why do people criticize? What is it in us that, that, that makes us want to be critical and to criticize people? So let's throw up some, well, here, before we throw them up, what are some reasons, real quick? You can mumble back and forth between yourselves as you're figuring this out. But why do people criticize? Because we're uncomfortable. Because we're uncomfortable. That's a good one. We get angry. It's a character issue. It is. Frustrated. Make our fellow selves like the Pharisees. We want to feel like we're in control. We're the boss. So here's a few that I threw up. Let's just look at those. To feel better. Some of us actually feel better when we can criticize somebody else. I'm not sure what that is. It's probably really sick, and I'm sure some counselor would be able to help you with that, but we just feel better when we criticize. Often we do it as a reaction. When something doesn't go our way, when somebody criticizes us, what's the first thing you want to do when somebody criticizes you? Well, you, and then we want to criticize them. Some of us really do believe this is our gift. We think, well, I'm just really good at this. I'm not good at much, but I'm really good at this. Last week, we talked about a, a Jewish concept in their theology called Yetzirahara. And it's, it's an evil inclination that was a gift from God that was meant for good, but then we took it and we made something evil out of it. Right? The, the example I gave last week was God gave us hunger so we would eat food, but we took that and made gluttony out of it. Right? So, yes, for... I would say a fourth, maybe even a third of the people in the room, you are really good at seeing mistakes. You are really good at catching the things that are wrong. And you're having a wonderful time with the sermon notes today because I went and checked them after they were printed. It's like, oh my word. Anyway, and you're just having such a good time with that. Okay. In the end, yes, you have a gift to, to see something that needs correction. But again, what we said last week, are you part of the problem? Or are you part of the solution? Did God give you that gift so you could criticize? Or did God give you that gift so that you could help do something about it and team up with other people to, to have a, a solution? Some of us criticize because we, we think we're superior 
and we want to hold that position. We want to keep that notion alive that we are superior. We want to prove that we're superior. For some of us, it's easier to tear down than to grow up. It's easier to tear down than to grow up. Because if you become more like Jesus, you're going to criticize a lot less. Jesus is going to say some, some strong words in this text. I want you to notice as we're going through it, he's not criticizing. He is speaking the truth with an agenda, and we'll see what that is in a moment. So, it's easier to tear down than to grow up. It's easier to blame than take responsibility. Sometimes we criticize because we make assumptions. We have no context for what's happening, right? We, we really, do, no connection with what's really going on. And from a distance, we see something and we just judge it. And we criticize when we really even don't even know what we're talking about. A huge one is we stop seeing our own sin. And all we're really seeing is the shortcomings of others. We've stopped, as we say, and re engage drawing the circle around our own feet, and we're looking at putting hula hoops around everybody else in the room. And then, from a few weeks ago, we're jaded. We're a bunch of curmudgeons walking around, just harumphing around, and that's who we've become. That is so far less than what Jesus wants for us. And as you become a disciple and you follow Jesus, your critical spirit will evaporate. In verse 39, Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, so he's just addressing what they just said. They think we're superior and we're in a really good place because we're better children of Abraham than you are, is basically what they're saying. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. So there's going to be a trait here. And, and so we said uh, character a bit ago is a part of all of this. Yeah, the, one of the ways you know where you're at is who, you, who are you acting like? Your character is a reflection of what parent? If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me. Now, has anybody said that? No, but that's where this is going to go. So Jesus is like two steps ahead, which is probably always true, but he's way ahead of what's getting ready to happen. A man who has told you, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Abraham did not balk at the word of God to him. He embraced it. He left his people. He did, you know, what God led him to do. He said, if you were children of Abraham, you would be embracing God speaking right now. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we have not been born of sexual immorality. Dig, dig. We have one father, even God. Oh. As far as they knew, Jesus was born of sexual immorality. Joseph was not the dad, or however the rumors ran. So big dig to Jesus, which is again how criticism works. And they say, oh, okay, you're right, you're right. We're not Abraham's children, we're God's children. Because Jesus is referring to himself as the son of God. They were criticizing because they couldn't handle the truth and they weren't willing to let go of the notion that they were superior. They had to prove that they were better. But the reality is they just couldn't handle the truth. See how I resisted the temptation to make a movie quote? I did. Okay, move on. In Galatians, Paul says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, how do you live out the word of God? Love, love, love. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says the whole law, and he's quoting Jesus here, lands, the plain lands on loving your neighbor. But then Paul follows it by saying, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you may not be consumed by one another. We can know we're supposed to love each other and then still think it's okay to criticize, okay to gouge. 
and what we'll see in this, okay to even go to the point of lying. Just tip you off. Complaining, criticizing, next week lying. It's a progression. And in the end, it's all called gossip. Some of you think, well, gossip isn't gossip unless it's lying. That's gossip. Well, no, there's gossip that isn't lying. But does gossip usually move toward lying? Yeah. Saying things that aren't completely true? Yeah. So what is the difference? Because this is really the question of the morning. It's like, yeah, but God gave me an ability to see what's wrong and, and to critique a situation. And if he's given me authority and responsibility in life as a boss or as a parent or as you know, some kind of role of leadership, I have a responsibility to critique what's going on. So what's the difference between critique and criticism? When I was... 64. You know, I, I need to sing that song in church here in the next few weeks. In a couple months, I'm going to turn 64, and I will never be able to sing that song again. So I want to sing. It's an old Beatles song. How many know when I'm 64? Okay. But back when I was, uh, I think, a sophomore in high school, I tried out for my first play. And you, you're a part of a, of a, of a, a pro production, and as part of the process, you sit down and get critiqued. Anybody ever done like theater where you get critiqued? I thought, this is a lousy idea. Nothing I like less than standing in front of a bunch of people practicing something I'm not any good at yet, and then they get to critique. Because to me, it really just felt like criticism. So I get it that it's easy to kind of confuse what, what's the difference. A quick run through the New Testament. Let no, well here, let's do Jesus first. Verse 42 of chapter eight. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. Jesus said, you say you love God, but as Jesus will say later in this gospel, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. So the fact that you're rejecting me is highly uh, suspect of the fact that you don't really love God the way you think you do. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? That is a huge question. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you do not bear to hear my words. Jesus is here. Remember, text started with, he is here to make disciples, right? To love them and then launch them. That's what he's here to do. And he's talking to them. These other people are listening in and they don't want to be his disciple. He says, why, why won't you listen? And he says, you can't bear to hear my word. So they're going to move toward criticism. Jesus is going to move toward critique. Here's the difference. From Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So when we speak, the difference between critique and criticism is critique is to build up. Criticism is to tear down. I realize that's a simplification, but I think that works really well. When John was in the, in, in the Marines and you go to boot camp for you know, several months before you get to start, what's their number one goal? To tear you down. Why? So they can build you up. It was the only example I could think of. But where is it actually good to tear down a person? Well, they're tearing them down to build them up. So it's like, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. My son thinks everybody should go through boot camp. It's really good for you. For whatever it is, three or four months, you're not allowed to say me or I or any self-reference. That right there would change our culture. But critique and again, in drama, you critique a person's performance to help them get better, not to make them feel less. 1 Corinthians 14. Let all things, Greek word for all means all. Okay, there we go. Let all things be done. And he's talking about in church. When we get together, he's talking about this right now. Everything we do right now should be for one purpose, for building up. That's our job right now. We get together to build each other up. That's a great job description. 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul exhorts, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. Encourage means to speak into each other's lives. So speak into each other's lives. Get to know each other. That's why we're, we're on a campaign from now to Easter. 
Get to know the people that sit around you. Build some relationship. It's really fun. We're, we're not quite at the halfway mark and re-engaged, but we're getting close enough to the halfway mark that, that these couples are starting to go out and do things together and get to know each other and speak into each other's lives. It's just fun to watch it happen. You get a front row seat to God changing people's lives. But it doesn't happen if you don't know each other. So there's a campaign on now. Get to know the people around you so you can speak into their lives and build them up just as you are doing. Ephesians 4.12. The goal of leadership in the church, shepherds in the church, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, which is for building up the body of Christ. Our ministry is to build each other up. That's, every person in this room has been given authority to build up the other people in the room. And with authority comes responsibility. Romans 15, 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So is that a broader circle? Yeah, that's the people in your life. That's the Samaritan when Jesus told that story. It's the person that everybody thinks is on the outside and yet they're willing to have a neighbor relationship with you. We're supposed to treat everybody that way. So we're even supposed to build up the people that aren't in the church, our neighbors. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 14. So with yourself, since you are eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, how many people here would like God to show up more tangibly, manifest himself tangibly in your life on a regular basis, just like again and again and again and again? Okay, it says right here, this is how you do it. Strive to excel in building up the church. You want more manifestation of God in your life. Work hard, strive, work hard to build up other people in the body of Christ. And then God has a reason to show up and empower you to do that. Was it worth coming today? It was worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. Okay, good. So confession time. Do we use our words to tear down or to build up? Are we criticizing or are we critiquing? If you have a responsibility in somebody else's life, you have the authority to speak into that life. If it's not yours to do, even a fool is considered wise if he will keep his mouth shut. Proverbs. Sometimes the best thing to do is not talk. But if there's somebody in your life, you have authority and responsibility to build them up, which is what you do with your words. So what if we want to be that person more and we're not there and we would like to be more that person? The next few questions are going to help us with that. We're going to talk about character. We're going to talk about authority. And we're going to talk about humility. Understanding those three things will help you be better at building people up. So, what difference does character make? John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. How'd that go over? They're going, Abraham is our dad. And Jesus said, no, he's not. And they're going, well, God is our dad. Jesus said, no, he's not. Your dad's the devil. Now, that, that feels pretty harsh. And in the movie, part of the reason I stopped the clip when I did is in the movie, they really make him speak harshly there. Maybe. But just the context of the rest of the words he's saying, I don't think he's being harsh. I think he's just being straight. And then he's going to give the reason why he's saying what he's saying. And what he's saying is absolutely true. They just can't hear the truth. That's the problem. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Those are great words because they're absolutely true. He was a murderer from the beginning, and they're getting ready to try to stone him. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. So Jesus is saying, check your character. It'll let you know who your parents are. How do you know a person's character? 
We'll get there in a second. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Okay, so how do you know a person's character? If you're going to write a novel and you're going to create a character in the novel, character is not something that, I mean, Johnny can't pick me up and shake me by my heels and empty my pockets and my character falls out. It's not like that. It's not tangible. It's not physical. And Johnny goes, you are way too big for me to do that. But anyway. <laughs> but how, how do you know what a person's character is? Well, when you're writing a character in a novel, you look at three things. What they say, what they do, and how they respond. And, and if you ever watched a movie where they didn't do a good job of developing the character and the character was inconsistent and the way, they, they were developing a certain sense of character and then they just went a totally different direction with it, I hate that. Sorry, that's just a pet peeve. You probably don't care. Okay. <laughs> but in life, we... we communicate our character all the time by the way we speak, by the things we choose to do, and the ways we choose to respond to the craziness that is around us. Yeah. <laughs> kind of hurts, doesn't it? Okay. <clears throat> Keep moving. What did Satan and the Pharisees have in common? Jesus is saying, you are of your father, the devil. So what do they have in common? Satan is known as the prince of darkness, the devourer, the accuser, the deceiver, and the father of lies. Now, under deceiver, I put in parentheses there. In the Bible, Satan is the first one to interpret scripture, to interpret the word of God. Said to Eve, did God really say that? Is that really what he meant by what he said? Hmm. But this prince of darkness is the accuser. That's, that's the complainer in us. Complain, 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 complain. They did this, they did that. They did me, 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 me. All right. The devourer is the criticizer because, again, we are criticizing them to, to tear them down, to, as Paul said, bite and devour them. And then the deceiver is the liar in all of us. Now that's the world we were born into and that was our father of origin. But at the point that you give your heart and your life to Christ, you now have a new father. You are adopted into a new family. And there is a different character that is ours. But we often do what we do because we're not aware which is why we have this silly little band that we put around our wrist. How different will we be if just for a month we pay attention? Am I a complainer? Am I a criticizer? Or am I someone that builds other people up? What difference does character make all the difference. It's all about character. It is a character issue. What difference does authority make? Because there are times where God expects you to say something that might be hard to say. Jesus here is saying things that are hard to say as far as from the Pharisee's side and from the people that are standing around. From their side, it's like, this is really hard to hear. But yet, it was still his to do. Verse 45. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you can criticize me? Which one of you can convict me of sin? What in me is there to criticize? <laughs> For that matter, what in him is there to critique? But we move on. If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Everything Jesus is saying is true and everything he is saying is to wake them up to the truth so that they can have a relationship with their God. 
1 Corinthians 8, 1. We know that all of us possesses knowledge. We all, all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The problem is, we all think we know what we're talking about. At some level, the older you get, you figure, I've figured out a few things. I got something to say. We all have, any translator put it in quotes, and I think correctly is interpreting the, the, the spirit of what's being said. We think we're all that. We think we know what we're talking about. But that knowledge is not what gives us authority. We need to speak out of a position of authority. And again, not as an authoritarian, but what is the authority we were given? What is the responsibility we've been given? To build each other up and not tear each other down. So we speak without authority. And when you speak in the authority that is yours, your words carry weight. God is in what you are saying. But when we think we're pretty impressive and we're all that, our knowledge will just puff us up. But love will build up. So authority makes a difference. And then finally, what difference does humility make? Verse 48. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and, a, and have a demon? I feel like I'm talking to teenagers here. I'm just saying. They're just thrown out the only smoke they can come up with. Now, are they saying he's a Samaritan? Because Galilee was north of, of Samaria and that he would often travel through Samaria and a good Jew would never do that. So it's like, well, you must all be related and that's why you get along with those people so well and you must be one of them and you must have a demon because you're just talking crazy talk. I want you to notice how much Jesus does not get dissuaded by their smoke and he just moves on to the point. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. But that's not the point. The point is, I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not speak for my own glory. Jesus, if anybody that ever walked the planet could speak for their own glory, it's him. But he gave up all of that, Philippians 2, and took on our form and humbled himself to the point of a horrific death, a, a criminal's death. I do not speak, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Notice in this translation that, that one is capitalized because it's a reference to his heavenly father. God seeks the son's glory. Truly, truly, true truth, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. He started this discussion with, if you're my disciple, you will abide in my, in my word, and that will set you free. He ends it by saying, and if you're abiding in that, he doesn't let all this craziness stop him from making his point. And he adds to it, and you will never see death. You will never see estrangement from God or separation from God or an eternity without God. You will never see that. But you have to keep his words. So let's close this with why do you speak? This week you'll be thinking this as you're talking to people. Why am I speaking? To be a critic or to be a disciple maker? See, it works like this. Jesus is standing on the hill, getting ready to leave. He's raised, been raised from the dead. He's having a final conversation with his disciples. He says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Not teaching them to know all I've commanded you, but teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. And I'm with you always. Go get them. One of two things is true. He's either just talking to those guys and their job was done 2,000 years ago and we're just all coasting from now on or he's talking to all of us. 
It's either all of us or none of us. When Jesus makes a disciple, they're first a pupil, and then they're a peer, and then they're a pastor or a shepherd. I'm just being Baptist here. I'm going with all P words. A pupil, a peer, a pastor. Well, some of us are Baptists. You appreciate that. Jesus is at a point with his disciples where they are going from pupils to where soon they will be peers. And they will be building each other up and they will be speaking into each other's lives. And they will be the beginning of the body of Christ ministering to each other. But in the end, we all know that what? They're going to end up shepherds, pastors. And they're going to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Shepherds who make shepherds who make shepherds who make shepherds. So, when you speak, you are making disciples. But for which father? With a critical heart and spirit, you're building the wrong team. We need to see ourselves. If you don't know Jesus, it's time to become a pupil. If you're a pupil, it's time to become a peer. And if you're a peer, it's time to become a pastor. Someone who then can, can help that pupil who, who knows nothing at this point. Jesus loved them for three years and then he launched them. Your job is not to be a pupil the rest of your days without becoming a peer and a pastor. Some of you go, I don't use that word, it scares me. Jesus said to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Shepherd and pastor is the same word. There are very few synonyms in the English language, but I would say that's pretty much, those are synonyms. So, who do you want to be? Are you going to be a critic? Or are you going to be a disciple maker? Are you going to build up? Or are you going to tear down? Are you going to stay God? Or are you going to obey God? Think about it. Why do we do what we do? Why do we try to keep a superior stance? Because we think we're God. We self-protect to protect our illusion of being in control of our own life. And it all goes back, not to our Heavenly Father, but it all goes back to me. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So this is a pretty clear delineation of path. What we can't do and be effective is try to do both. If we really want to follow Jesus, if we want to make disciples that are his disciples and watch them be launched to be peers and then pastors themselves, we have to stop criticizing and start building people up. Let's all stand for prayer. Lord God, we thank you that um, you are very gracious. When, when we stop and think all the ways that you put up with us and all the squirrely things we do going sideways and trying to uh, inject the character of the, of the father of this world into ourselves when our character needs to be your character, and yet you still love us and you're still patient and you still draw us to yourself. You speak hard words to us, but not to tear us down. If there's a voice playing in our head that's tearing us down, it's not you. You don't tear down. You build up. So Lord God, for each of us, as we prepare our hearts for communion, we just need some face time with you. Speak to us in ways we can hear and understand. Help us this week to really give some focus some focused attention to not being critical, but to be life-giving, to give grace, to build up and not tear down. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.